The earliest source of music and hymns in America were the Psalters, which are books that contain uh, uh, versions of the Psalms, metered in, without going into too much detail about how they were set up, these were uh, ways, verses from the Bible that were composed or arranged in poetry so that they rhymed and that they had a certain meter, usually 4-4. And in these English Psalters that were brought over to America, one in particular, the, the Bay Psalm book was published, uh, probably the first book published in America. <clears throat> and uh, one of the, the hymns was called Old 100, which we're going to hear later on. Uh, in the in the version of Sherburn, which is in your book in a listening less, uh, listening guide, so it was published in Cambridge in 1640, Massachusetts, and it was the first book ever to be published in North America. So it's pretty notable, the Bay Psalm Book. So uh, at that time, cities or small towns were growing into larger towns and cities and there was an urban style that was more European based and that European based style is not what we're focusing on. We're focusing on the more rural American sound uh, religious music and some of the things that the characteristics of the rural sound we'll talk about briefly. Uh, for one thing these sal psalters of the Psalms were originally notated but uh, eventually the oral tradition took over. People in those days were fortunate to even be able to read words, much less music. And so most of the church worship uh, was sung by the congregation in a form known as lining out. And this, this technique is as old as David in the Bible. There's, in, in fact, the Psalms were originally designed, since there was no notated music in Bible times, was originally designed to be sung by a cantor or a leader who had a strong voice <clears throat> and he would sing the first line and the congregation would answer or repeat whichever was the case. So lining out was a technique that was used to teach the congregation music and to lead the worship service. Um, This is a form of call and response that uh, was not a new idea. It had begun in England and Scotland. In fact, it's still a common practice today in some rural regions. So the rural style was uh, more of a folk style, I guess, because it's handed down in an oral tradition. Remember, that's one of the hallmarks of folk music. It's not written out uh, so that people read it and perform it in that way. And the voices, the vocalists are not trained. Obviously, even today in congregations, <clears throat> singers are not trained, but they hear a lot of music. And in those days, singing was just uh, an activity you did in in church. And whether or not you could sing well or 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 not at all, you could you could participate. So that was as opposed to the other more refined style that was brought over from Europe in the cities, in the urban settings. Now, after a while, the ministers and some of the preachers decided that they wanted to raise the quality of music and the, the state of singing in the churches was deplorable. And this is in New England. So in New England, as people became more and more urbanized, or as they became more and more uh, well-off and settled into the towns, they wanted to learn how to sing. And so they, they would have uh, an itinerant singing master that would travel through the, the towns and the small uh, uh, urban areas where people would congregate. And they had somebody, something called the singing schools. And a singing master would come uh, and he would meet probably at uh, someone's house or at the town meeting place. And some of these uh, singing masters would bring books and he'd have sometimes more than a day, two or three days, he'd have a school. 
And these schools were designed to train people how to sing. And one of the earliest ways to do that would have been the shape note system. Uh, instead of just reading notes on reading notes on a music staff, you had reading shaped notes on a music staff. So people could look at those notes and know which note, which pitch to sing. And this is called the um, fa sol la or the uh, shaped note system. And the shaped note system, let's put, put this over here. You can see that we talked about lining out, singing schools. The shaped note system on page You'll see an example on page 61, Sherburn. It's our listening guide, number nine. And there's a score, which means that you have four music staffs on top, one on top of another. And if you get out page 60 and 61 on your book and look at it, you'll see that the notes are not all round notes. Some of them are square, some of them are triangle, <clears throat> and some of them are round. Some of them are diamond shaped, and each one of these shapes represents a pitch in the scale. Uh, thus, you have fa sol la, fa sol la, uh, do re mi fa sol la, the fa sol la system. And I want to play an example of uh, of that. And this is an example of the rural style that uh, was recorded in the 50s, I believe. As a matter of fact, this is this comes from a Sacred Harp, which is a collection that was published in 1844 of these hymns. Some of them have survived, many of them have not. Uh, as the book says, some of these, the more popular hymns were combined into one hymn, and so a lot of stuff happens in the oral tradition that uh, can confuse historians. In other words, lots of uh, music is combined and we don't really know since nothing was recorded or nothing was notated exactly how it happened but in each church uh, in isolated areas of the country uh, the practitioner practitioners in the practices would have been different and they would have evolved in an oral tradition so this is uh, an example of fossil law singing it recorded in 1959 and I'm told you can still hear it today. 'Cadence means a closing part, and then you continue on with the next verse. So what are the lyrics? There's so many things we could talk about here. The lyrics, fa, so, so, la, la, so, so, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they're singing to get their pitches. They're singing the, the notes, and you can hear the different parts. You can hear uh, the top part, middle parts, and the low parts, sung, of course, by the, the males. Females would have sung the higher parts, just like they. And this is written out just like any hymn book now with uh, the four parts, for the most part. Or, or um, when you look in a hymn book today, you'll see actually two staffs, two music staffs, but on each staff you have two lines of music. So on the top staff, and of course we know what a staff is, a staff of the four, five lines and four spaces of music. Um, and we'll be talking more about that. but. But you'll, you'll see on the top staff the two lines of music for the females and on the bottom staff the two lines of music that go along for the males. So you have S-A-T-B, soprano, alto, the female voices, T-B, uh, tenor and bass. Now that's the European uh, legitimate uh, educated style of singing. Uh, but as we said, this was the oral tradition and these people are learning through the singing schools in New England and they're learning through these publications uh, the Sacred Harp, I believe, was mentioned in your book. What's another one? The Easy Instructor, published in Philadelphia in 1801. So these are early attempts to educate the congregations and the people of America, the Protestant congregations, uh, to sing 
uh, more and to sing better. Sing more better. You got it? Okay. So uh, we went from lining out to the singing schools. Now we're into the shape note system. And we hear Sherburn. And we hear, so, we could, like I said, we could talk so much about the style. It is a rough style. They're not singing with any subtlety. They're singing at the top of their voices. Pretty, pretty loud. But uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that there's a lot of what we call imitative counterpoint or imitation. 